Hi, hello, good evening. Welcome to another episode. In a moment, we're going to carry on. We're going to finish Wintersmith by Terry Pratchett. First, let me just explain my absence from yesterday. So I thought I'd be really clever and I noticed that my webcam isn't as good as it could be. It's pretty grainy. You don't get to see all the blemishes on my face. Uh, I thought, I can't keep wearing my kids' gamers <laughs> headset. So I, what I did, I, um, I started another channel up yesterday. This one is for GCSE books. In the United Kingdom, those that don't know, GCSE is the kind of the end of high school exams, the, like the really important ones actually. So I thought, do you know what? Lots of people always fall asleep listening to my stories. And I thought, what about if I record some GCSE texts for people sitting their GCSEs to fall asleep listening to? <gasps> so I got my iPhone set up. Other phones are available. I got my iPhone set up. I bought this like microphone. To be honest, it was mega cheap. Welcome to Mr. S. It was mega cheap and um, I had to clip it on my necktie and then plug it into my phone. And when I listened to it back, <laughs> but I uploaded it anyway, just to see what kind of interest I got. I got five subscribers on it already, but that's my family. <laughs> um, but yeah, so you're welcome to go and have a look. Instead of being called Mr. S does a story, it's cleverly, cunningly titled, Mr. S Does GCSE. <laughs> so I think if on my channel, if you look at my channels that I follow, you'll see it's one of them. All right. Now, the first book that I started to do on there was nothing little, nothing light, only a play. And as I sat there, I thought, how am I going to do reading a play just on my own? But... I'm just going to have to drag out all of the voices. Luckily, with our old wee free men, we've got the nice Scottish accent. And, of course, Macbeth. He is the Scottish. He's the Thane, isn't he? A Thane. A nobleman of Scotland. So, um, yeah, if you want to have a listen to that, you're more than welcome to. I'll do a little bit more later on. Um, now, also, <laughs> I think I really need to get a hobby. Maybe this is my hobby. Anyway, um, I also did another channel, which I started a long old time ago when people said that they liked listening to stories being read to them. So what I did, I called that one Whispered Pages. And all I do on that one is read in a whisper, but like mega, mega close up like this. And the only problem I found was when I said any or like that, it was too grace. This isn't a good microphone for that, so but you're welcome to check it out. I haven't uploaded on Whispered Pages for a long, old time because no one was really very interested. But I can do some more if I if I get the call. But anyway, <coughs> excuse me. Back to this channel. As I said yesterday, the day before. We're now in the last chapter of this one, so we need to choose our next book, and I'm going to have a look at the poll, which is on this channel. I'm going to have a look at the poll. Uh, you could either choose Keys to the Kingdom Book 2, Grim Tuesday. You could have chosen A Bad Spell in Yet by E. Dale Britton. Or you could have chosen The Phantom Tollbooth by Norton Jester. At the moment... This one is winning. If you don't want this one to be read, you'd rather Grim Tuesday or A Bad Spelling Yet be read. You go for it. Get on that poll. Vote. I think maybe 26 people have voted so far. Last time I looked, there was 521 subscribers to this channel. But um, go and vote, won't you? And I'll just tomorrow, like I said, at tea time, when I come up here to record the story, I'll have a look. And whichever one is winning at that time is the one I'll start. So I'll leave it open until tea time tomorrow. UK time. Tea time. <laughs> anyway, after all that, shall we finish the Wintersmith story? I really think we owe it to ourselves and to Terry to f and to Tiffers 
to finish our Wintersmith story. Before I do, I saw that someone else had requested some more of the, a, a different series by Terry Pratchett, not even Discworld. Uh, I, truckers, Carpet People, what? I'm trying to think of the list of the ones for it. Um, diggers? Wings? Possibly? The Brom Bromeliad trilogy, anyway. So um, I'm happy to do that one. I can put it on the list after we've chosen this one for the next, next book. You never know. Anyway, deep breath. We need to finish the story. So get in the comfiest place in your entire home. Make sure there's no disturbances, no distractions. Are you going to have headphone it or are you going to TV it? Or are you going to phone it? How are you going to listen? You got your cup of tea, coffee, biscuit, cake, glass of water, smoothie. <laughs> the options are endless. Let's just start, shall we? Six minutes in and I haven't even started. The entire top of the ice palace was melted in a flash of white light that cast shadows on walls a hundred miles away. A pillar of steam roared up, stitched with lightning, and spread out above the world like an umbrella, covering the sun. Then it began to fall back as a soft, warm rain that punched little wormholes into the snow. Tiffany, her head usually so full of thoughts, hadn't got a thought to spare. She lay on a slab of ice in the soft rain and listened to the palace collapse around her. There are times when everything that you can do has been done and there's nothing for it now but to curl up and wait for the thunder to die down. There was something else in the air too, a golden glint that vanished when she tried to look at it and then turned up again in the corner of her eye. The palace was melting like a waterfall. The slab she lay on half slid and half floated down a staircase that was turning into a river. Above her, huge pillars fell, but went from ice to a gush of warm water in mid-air so that what crashed down was spray. Goodbye to the glittering crown, thought Tiffany. Goodbye to the dress made of dancing light. Goodbye to the ice roses and the snowflakes. Such a shame, such a shame. And then there was grass under her, and so much water pouring past her that it was a case of get up or drown. She managed to get to her knees, at least, and waited until it was possible to stand up without being knocked over. You have something of mine, child, said a voice behind her. She turned and golden light rushed into a shape. It was her own shape, but her eyes were odd, like a snake's. Right here and now, with the roaring of the heat of the sun still filling her ears, this didn't seem very amazing. Slowly, Tiffany took the cornucopia out of her pocket and handed it over. You're the summer lady, aren't you? she asked. And you are the sheep girl who would be me. There was a hiss to the words. I didn't want to be, said Tiffany hurriedly. Why do you look like me? The summer lady sat down on the turf which steamed. It's very strange to watch yourself, and Tiffany noticed she had a small mole on the back of her neck. It's called resonance, she said. Do you know what that is, child? Uh, it means to vibrate with, said Tiffany. How does a sheep girl know that? I've got a dictionary, said Tiffany, and I'm a witch, thank you. Well, while you were picking up things from me, I've been picking up things from you, clever sheep witch said the summer lady. She was beginning to remind Tiffany a lot of Anna Grammer. That was actually a relief. She didn't sound wise or nice. She was just another person who happened to be very powerful but not frighteningly smart and, frankly, a bit annoying. What's your real shape? she asked. The shape of heat on a road. The shape of the smell of apples. Nice reply, Tiffany thought, but not helpful as such. Tiffany sat down next to the goddess. Am I in trouble? she asked. Because of what you did to the wintersmith? No. He has to eat, die every year, as do I. We die and sleep and wake. Besides, you were entertaining, child. Oh, I was entertaining, was I? said Tiffany, her eyes narrowing. What is it that you want, child? said the summer lady. Mm hmm, thought Tiffany, just like Anagramma wouldn't spot a hint a mile high. Want, said Tiffany. Nothing. Just the summer, thank you. The summer lady looked puzzled. But humans always want something from gods. 
but witches don't accept payment. Green grass and blue skies will do me. What? You'll get those anyway. The summer lady sounded both confused and angry, and Tiffany was quite happy about this in a small and spiteful way. Good, she said. But you saved the world from the wintersmith. Actually, I saved it from a silly girl, Miss Summer. I put right what I put wrong. One simple mistake. You'd be a silly girl not to accept a reward. I'd be a sensible young and woman to refuse one, said Tiffany, and it felt good to say that. Winter is over. I know, I've seen it through. Where it took me, I chose to go. I chose when I danced with the wintersmith. The summer lady stood up. Remarkable, she said. And strange. And now we part. But first, some more things must be taken. Stand up, young woman. Tiffany did so, and when she looked into the face of summer, golden eyes became pits that drew her in. And then the summer filled her up. It must have been only for a few seconds, but inside them it went on for much longer. She felt what it was like to be the breeze through green corn on a spring day, to ripen an apple, to make the salmon leap in the rapids. The sensations came all at once and merged into one great big glistening golden yellow feeling of summer which grew hotter. Now the sun turned red in a burning sky. Tiffany drifted through air like warm oil into the searing calm of deep deserts where even camels die. There was no living thing. Nothing moved except ash. She drifted down a dried up riverbed with pure white animal bones on the banks. There was no mud, not one drop of moisture in this oven of a land. This was a river of stones. Agates banded like a cat's eye, garnets lying loose, thunder eggs with their rings of colour, stones of brown, orange, creamy white, some with black veins, all polished by the heat. Here is the heart of the summer, hissed the voice of the summer lady. Fear me as much as the wintersmith. We are not yours, though you give us shapes and names. Fire and ice we are, in balance. Do not come between us ever again. And now, at last, there was movement. From out of gaps between the stones, they came like stones brought alive. Bronze and red, umber and yellow, black and white, with harlequin patterns and deadly gleaming scales. The snakes tested the boiling air with their forked tongues and hissed triumphantly. The vision vanished. The world came back. The water had poured away. The everlasting wind had teased the, fro the fogs and steams into long streamers of cloud, but the unconquered sun was finding its way through. And, as always happens, and happens far too soon, the strange and wonderful becomes a memory, and a memory becomes a dream. Tomorrow it's gone. Tiffany walked across the grass where the palace had been. There were a few pieces of ice left, but they would be gone in an hour. There were the clouds but clouds drifted away. The normal world pressed in on her with its dull little songs. She was walking on a stage after the play was over, and who now could say it ever happened? Something sizzled on the grass. Tiffany reached down and picked up a piece of metal. It was still warm with the last of the heat that had twisted it out of shape, but you could see that it had once been a nail. No, I won't take a gift to make the giver feel better, she thought. Why should I? I'll find my own gifts. I was entertaining to her, that's all. But him, he made me roses and icebergs and frost and never understood. She turned quickly at the sound of voices. The feagles came bounding over the slope of the downs at a speed just fast enough for a human to keep up. And Roland was keeping up, panting a little, his overlarge chainmail making him run like a duck. She laughed. Two weeks later, Tiffany went back to Lankra. Roland took her as far as two shirts and the pointy hat took her the rest of the way. That was a bit of luck. The driver remembered Miss Tick and since there was a spare space on the roof of the coach, he wasn't prepared to go through all that again. The roads were flooded, the ditches gurgled, the swollen rivers sucked at the bridges. First, she visited Nanny Og, who had to be told everything. That saved some time because once you've told Nanny Og, you've more or less told everybody else. When she heard exactly what Tiffany had done to the wintersmith, she laughed and laughed. Tiffany borrowed Nanny's broomstick and flew slowly across the forests to Miss Treason's cottage. Things were going on. In the clearing, several men were digging the vegetable area, 
and lots of people were hanging around the door, so she landed back in the woods, shoved the broom in a rabbit hole and her hat under a bush, and walked back on foot. Stuck in a birch tree where the track entered the clearing was a doll, maybe, made out of lots of twigs bound together. It was new and a little bit worrying. That was probably the idea. She took the back way through the trees. No one saw her raise the catch on a scullery door or slip inside the cottage. She leaned against the kitchen wall and went quiet. From the next voice came the unmistakable voice of anagrammer and her most typically anagrammatical. Only a tree. Do you understand? Cut it up and share the wood. Agreed? Now, shake hands. Go on. I mean it. Properly or else I'll get angry. Good. That feels better, doesn't it? Let's have no more of this silliness. After ten minutes of listening to people being scolded, grumbled at and generally prodded, Tiffany crept out again, cut back through the woods and walked into the clearing via the track. There was a woman hurrying towards her, but she stopped when Tiffany said, Excuse me, is there a witch near here? Oh yeah, said the woman and gave Tiffany a hard stare. You're not from round here, are you? No, said Tiffany and thought, I lived here for months, Mrs Carter, and I saw you most days, but I always wore the hat. People always talk to the hat. Without the hat, I'm in disguise. Well, there's Miss Hawkin, said Miss Carter, as if reluctant to give away a secret. Be careful, though. She leaned forward and lowered her voice. She turns into a terrible monster when she's angry. I've seen it. She's all right with us, of course, she added. Lots of young witches have been coming to learn things from her. Gosh, she must be good, said Tiffany. She's amazing, Mrs Carter went on. She had only been here five minutes and she seemed to know all about us. Amazing, said Tiffany. You'd think that somebody had written it all down, twice. But that wouldn't be interesting enough, would it? And who would believe that a real witch brought her face from Boffo? Anne, she's got a cauldron that goes bubbly green, said Mrs Carter with pride. All down the sides. That's proper witching, that is. Yeah, sounds like it, said Tiffany. No witch, she admit, had done anything with a cauldron apart from make stew, but somehow people believed in their hearts that a witch's cauldron should bubble green. And that must be why Mr Boffo sold item number 61, bubbling green cauldron kit, $14, extra sachets of green, $1 each. Well, it worked. Probably shouldn't, but people were people. She didn't think Anna Grammer would be particularly interested in a visit right now, especially from someone who'd read all the way through the Boffo catalogue. So she retrieved her broom and headed on to Granny Weatherwax's cottage. There was a chicken run out in the back garden now. It had been carefully woven out of very pliable hazel and contented... and contented... were coming from the other side. Granny Weatherwax was coming out of the back door. She looked at Tiffany as if she'd just come back from walking around the cottage. I got business down in the town right now, she said. Wouldn't worry me if you came along. That was, from Granny, as good as a brass band and an illuminated scroll of welcome. Tiffany fell in alongside her as she strode off along the track. I hope I find you well, Mistress Weatherwax, she said, hurrying up. I'm still here after another winter, that's all I know, said Granny. You look well, girl. Oh, yeah. We saw the steam all from up here, said Granny. Tiffany said nothing. That was it. Well, yeah, from Granny, that would be. After a while, Granny said, Come back to see your young friends, eh? Tiffany took a deep breath. She'd been through this in her head dozens of times. What would she say? What would Granny say? What should she shout? What would Granny she would shout? You planned it, didn't you? She said, if you'd suggested one of the others, they'd probably have got the cottage, so you suggested me, and you knew, you just knew that I'd help her, and it all worked out, didn't it? I bet every witch in the mountains knows what happens by now. I bet Mrs. Irwage is seething, and the best bit is, nobody got hurt. Anagrammas picked up where Miss Treason left off, all the villages are happy, and you have won. I expect you'll say it was keep to keep me busy and teach me important things and keep my mind off Wintersmith. But you still won, Granny. Granny Weatherwax walked on calmly. After a while, she said, I see you're what got your little trinket back. It was like having a bolt of lightning and then not getting any thunder, or throwing a pebble into a pool and not getting a splash. What? Oh, the horse. Yes, look, I... What kind of fish? Um, pike, said Tiffany. Ah, some likes them, but they're too muddy for my taste. In most stories, it's salmon.
And that was that. Against Granny's calm, she had nowhere to go. She could nag, she could whine, and it wouldn't make any difference. Tiffany consoled herself with the fact that at least Granny knew that she knew. It wasn't much, but it was all she was going to get. And the horse ain't the only trinket I see, Granny continued. Magic, is it? She always stuck a K on the end of any magic she disapproved oh. She always stuck a K on the end of any magic she disapproved of. Tiffany glanced down at the ring on her finger. It had a dull shine. It had never rust while she wore it. The blacksmith had told her this because of the oils in her skin. He'd even taken the time to cut little snowflakes in it with a tiny chisel. It's just a ring I had made out of a nail, she said. Iron enough to make a ring, said Granny, and Tiffany stopped dead. Did she really get into people's minds? It had to be something like that. And why did you decide that you wanted a ring, said Granny. For all sorts of reasons, which never quite managed to be clear in Tiffany's head, she knew. All she could think of was to say was, it seemed like a good idea at the time. She waited for the explosion. Well, then it probably was, said Granny mildly. She stopped, pointed away from the path in the direction of Nanny Ogg's house and said, I put a fence round it. That's got other things protecting it. You may be sure of that, but some beasts is just too stupid to scare. It was the oak tree sapling, already five feet high. A fence of poles and woven branches surrounded it. Growing fast for oak, said Granny. I'm going to keep an eye on it. But can't. I don't want to miss it. She set off again, covering the ground fast. Bewildered, Tiffany ran after her. Miss what? she panted. The dance, of course. Isn't it too early for that? Not up here. They starts up here. Granny hurried along the paths and behind gardens and came out into the town square which was thronged with people. Small stalls had been set up, a lot of people were standing around in the slightly hopeless, why are we here, way of crowds who are doing what their heart wants to do but their head feels embarrassed about, but at least there were hot things on sticks to eat. There were lots of white chickens too. Very good eggs, Nanny had said, so it would have been a shame to kill them. Granny walked to the front of the crowd. There was no need to push people out of the way. They just moved sideways without noticing. They'd arrived just in time. A lot of children came running along the road to the bridge, only just ahead of the dancers who, as they trudged along with the top-hatted fool in the lead, seemed like quite homely and ordinary men. Men she'd seen often working in forges or driving carts. They all wore white clothes, or at least clothes that had been white once, and like the audience, they looked a bit sheepish, their expressions suggesting that this was all just a bit of fun, really, not to be taken seriously. They were even waving this to people in the crowd. Tiffany looked around and saw Miss Tick and Nanny and even Mrs Irwaj, nearly every witch she knew. And there was Anna Grammer, minus Mr Boffo's little devices, and looking very proud. It wasn't like this last autumn, she thought. It was dark and quiet and solemn and hidden, everything that this isn't. He watched it from the shadows. He was watching now from the light. He was here in secret, at which point Granny Weatherwax took off her hat and placed you the kitten on the ground. A drummer and a man with an accordion pushed their way through the crowd along with the local publican carrying eight pints of beer on a tray because no grown man is going to dance in front of his friends with ribbons round his hat and bells on his trousers without the clear prospect of a large drink. When the noise had died down a bit, the drummer beat the drum a few times and the accordionist played the long drawn out chord, the legal signal that a Morris dance is about to begin, and people who hang around after this have only got themselves to blame. The two man band struck up. The men, in lines of three facing each other, counted the beat and then leaped. Tiffany turned to Granny as twelve hobnailed boots crashed to the ground, throwing up sparks. Tell me how to take a pain away. Tell. Tell me how to take away pain, she said above the noise of the dance. Quish! That's hard, said Granny, not taking her eyes off the dancers. Quish! went the boots again. You can move it out of the body. Quish! Sometimes. Or hide it. Or make a cage for it and carry it away. But all of it's dangerous and it will kill you if you don't respect it, young woman. It is all price and no profit. You're asking me to tell you how to put your hand in a lion's mouth. Quish! I must know, to help the Baron, she said. It's bad. There's a lot I have to do. This you choose to do? said Granny, still watching. Yes! Quish! This your Baron who don't like witches? 
said Granny, her gaze going from face to face in the crowd. But who does like witches until they need one, Mistress Weatherwax, said Tiffany sweetly. Whoosh! This is a reckoning, Mistress Weatherwax, Tiffany added. After all, once you've kissed the wintersmith, you're in the mood to dare. And Granny Weatherwax smiled as if she'd known all that was expected of her. Ah, is it now? she said. Very well. Come and see me again before you go and we'll make see, we'll see what you may take back with you. And I hopes you can close the door as that you open. Now, watch the people. Sometimes you get to see her. Tiffany paid attention to the dance. The fool had turned up without her noticing, wandering around collecting money in his greasy top hat. If a girl looked as though she'd squeal if he kissed her, he gave her a kiss. And sometimes, without any warning, he'd spring off into the dance, spinning through the leaping men with never a foot in the wrong place. When Tiffany saw it, the eyes of a woman on the other side of the dance flashed gold. Just for a moment they flashed gold. Once she'd seen it and she saw it again, in the eyes of a boy, a girl, a man holding a beer, moving around to watch the fool. Summer's here, said Tiffany, and realised that she was tapping her foot to the beat. She realised it because a heavier boot had just trodden on it and pinned it gently but firmly to the ground. Beside it, you looked up at her blue-eyed innocence that became, for the briefest fragment of a second, the lazy golden eyes of a snake. Yep. She's meant to be here, said Granny Weatherwax, removing her boot. A few coppers for luck, miss, said a voice close by. There was a sound of money being shaken in an ancient hat. Tiffany turned and looked into purple grey eyes. The face around them was lined and tanned and grinning. He had a gold earring. Copper or two for the lovely lady, he wheeled. Silver or gold, maybe? Sometimes, Tiffany thought, you just know how it should all go. Iron, she said taking the ring off her finger and dropping it into the hat. The fool picked it out delicately and flipped it into the air. Tiffany's eyes followed it, but somehow it wasn't in the air anymore, but it was glistening on the man's finger. Iron's enough, he said, and gave her a sudden kiss on the cheek. It was only slightly chilly. The galleries inside the Fiegel Mound were crowded but hushed. This was important. The honour of the clan was at stake here. In the middle was a large book, taller than Rob and filled with colourful pictures. It was quite muddy from its journey down into the mound. Rob had been challenged. For years he'd thought himself to be a hero, and then the Hagga Hag said that he wasn't. Not really. I've got to go off Scottish here. Well, you couldn't argue with the Hagga Hags, but he was going to rise to the challenge. Oh, aye, so he was, or his name was near Rob anybody. Where's my cow? He read, Is that my cow? It gives cluck. It is a, a chicken. It is not my cow. And then there's this wee painting of a couple of chickens. There's another page, right? It is indeed, Rob, said Billy Big Chin. There was a cheer from the assembled feagles as Rob ran around the book, waving his hands in the air. Ah, and this one's a lot harder than Apka, right? He said when he'd done the circuit. That one was easy and a very predictable plot. Whoever rated that book didn't stretch himself, in my opinion. Rob, Apka, do you mean the ABC? said Billy Bigchin. Aye! Rob jumped up and down and punched the air a few times. Got something a wee bit tougher for me? The Gonagall looked at the stack of battered books the Feagles had, in various ways, collected. Something I can get my teeth into, Sir Rob added. A big old book. Well, this one here is called Principles of Modern Accountancy, said Billy doubtfully. And is that a big heroic book for me to read, said Rob, running on the spot. I probably, but... Rob anybody held up a hand for silence and looked across at Jeannie, who had a crowd of little feagles surrounding her. She was smiling at him, and his sons were staring at their father in silent astonishment. One day, Rob thought, they'll be able to walk up even to even the longest words and give them a good kick in. Not even commas and those tricksy semicolons will stop them. He had to be a hero. I'm feeling good about this reading, said Rob anybody. Bring it on! And he read Principles of Modern Accountancy all morning. But just to make it interesting, he put a couple of dragons in it as well. Ta-da! 
just under 30 minutes left. Did you stick with me the whole time? Oh, I hope so. Okay, so don't forget, go and vote. Toll booth. Tuesday. Yurt. That's your next job. Then, Mr. S does GCSE. Bit of Macbeth. Then, Whispered Pages. Don't forget to go and check that one out as well. I haven't uploaded on it for a while, but you get to see me with it with different stages of hairstyle. <laughs> Surely that's enough for anyone. <laughs> Alright, okay. Thanks very much for going through the journey of Wintersmith with you with me. If you're a new subscriber because of Wintersmith, don't worry. We'll have the next instalment of the Tiffany series coming up very, very soon. But like I said, we've got some other books to get through first. So I really hope you stick around. I hope you liked it. Um, let me know. Is there anything else you want? Like I said, I'll take recommendations. I'll take advice about my webcam, particularly the headset, the gamer's headset, <laughs> anything. <laughs> I'm, I'm willing to learn. All right. Okay. 31 minutes. I really need to stop now. I'll see you all tomorrow for the start of our new book. Over and out.